I was recently approached to be an affiliate marketer of this company that makes phone cases. And at first I was like, eh. But then they told me they wanted to get into aviation and they're going to start making iPad cases because they know how much pilots love iPads. So I thought, okay, I'll check them out. So I took a look and guys, I was actually blown away. I didn't know there was ingenuity like this for phone cases and phone accessories. So everything is like magnetized. So, and it's all thin by the way, because I hate when I have like a bulky bulky case or whatever so you have this case that's got a magnet in it so it's a phone case it's sturdy it's durable it's sturdy it's got a magnet in it and then they sell things like mounts so a little mount that you can put in your car or your aircraft and then the magnet just sticks to the magnet on the mount and then bam and it holds it there perfectly through turbulence and all this stuff and then they also have these really thin mag wallets and i've been looking for a thin wallet forever and same thing it can just stick using the magnet to the back of your phone cases. Now it's like a two in one, but you can also separate them if you don't want it so bulky like me. I feel like this was actually made for me and I didn't know this ingenuity ingenuity existed in phone cases. So I ordered about six or seven of the things and I'm excited to see what comes next when they get into aviation and iPads. So with all that said, I made sure because I'm always about saving you guys money and only recommending good products, you can get 15% off by using coupon code part-time pilot that's part-time pilot no spaces all caps at scooch.com slash part-time pilot i'll put that link in the show notes right now they're doing a buy one get one so go and check them out get 15 percent off i really really like scooch and they have a fun name so go and check them out and let me know what you think Hello and welcome to the Audio Ground School podcast. My name is Nick Smith, the host of the podcast and founder and creator of parttimepilot.com, where we help student pilots achieve their dream of flight as easily and affordably as possible. All right, guys. So this episode is dropping on like March 27th or so. And in our last episode, we covered stalls. And then the one before that, we covered lift. We're in the fundamentals of aerodynamics section of the ground school. So if you're following along in the ground school, just go to your course labeled step one online ground school private pilot lessons from your dashboard. And then check out section seven fundamentals of aerodynamics. And we are on starting lesson four on spins and we're probably going to get through that and then maybe we'll get to lesson five and six on weight and thrust and then after that we'll get into drag and stuff like that so exciting stuff really in-depth look at the fundamentals of aerodynamics that's my background as an aerospace engineer so i kind of nerd out on this stuff a little bit but i appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to the podcast and i have a few announcements before we get started please if you haven't subscribed please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast it really helps us out just in terms of getting getting seen on the different podcast apps and something like I think I saw like 70% of the people that listen to the podcast aren't actually subscribers so if you could just subscribe then you get kind of notified I know on my iPhone with the Apple podcast I get notified when there's a new new episode and then it kind of automatically downloads which is great because sometimes I'll go to you know I'll go on a flight or whatever where I don't have internet service and having those already downloaded if I forgot to download them is really really helpful so please go ahead and subscribe leave us a good review if you can too that helps us out a lot the next thing and i mentioned this last episode part-time pilot is going to have a presence at oshkosh this year that's a big air show in oshkosh wisconsin so if you are going and you are interested in getting a free t-shirt and $25 and then possibly a lot more money by simply just being there there's a link in the show notes to sign up for Oshkosh waitlist. We got a ton of people interested in this already, so we're probably not going to select everybody that signs up to the waitlist, but the waitlist will be your only chance to have a chance to sign up for that. When you sign up for the waitlist, you'll get the emails and the information of what we're gonna do. Essentially, if you get signed up, we'll send you a free t-shirt. It's gonna have a QR code on it. It's gonna be a cool t-shirt. We're working on trying to make it a cool t-shirt, but it's gonna have a QR code on it that's specific to you. If you want the free t-shirt, that's all you have to do. You just have to sign up give us your address we'll send you the free t-shirt you could never talk to us again if you wanted just a free t-shirt that's fine then if you want 25 dollars, you just got to take a picture of yourself in the t-shirt while at oshkosh and i'll send you 25 dollars. okay literally the only thing you've done is taking a picture of yourself which who doesn't like doing that and then chance to make a lot more so that qr code on your shirt actually going to take people to free pilot training tools okay so i'm setting it up to have no matter what part of the journey they're in whether they're just getting started or wondering how to get started 
started, the steps to get started and get signed up as a student pilot, or if they are already studying and they maybe want some, some free study material or they're preparing for their final check ride, we're going to have something free for whoever they are, whatever part of the journey they are at this QR code. So all you have to do is say, hey, do you want free pilot training tools? Just scan this QR code. That's all you have to do to people. And if they scan that QR code and then they end up purchasing our online ground school, you get 33% of the sale. So this is a one thing, time thing we're doing. I had this idea. I thought it was pretty cool. I couldn't make it to Oshkosh myself. So I wanted to have a presence there. And I thought, hey, why not give my listeners, my audience, loyal peeps, a chance to make some money as well as spread the good word of part-time pilot. So I thought it was a cool idea. I don't know. It seems pretty easy. Uh, with a lot of people interested in it because I guess people like free t-shirts and, and free money. So if that is you, then go ahead and sign up with the waitlist in the show notes. That's that. That's all I want to say there. So now we can get started on the episode for today. Again, this is episode, what is this? Episode number, number 35. And we are in section seven, lesson four of the online ground school on spins. If you're not in the online ground school, I highly recommend supplementing these audio lessons. We are now putting the audio lessons in the lessons themselves. So you can take out all this mumbo jumbo that I'm saying right now and just hear the lesson part right above the lesson. So you can read the lesson. You can see all the diagrams, the mnemonic devices, the step-by-step examples, but then you can also click listen and just listen to it. Then you can take the quiz, watch the videos, all that good stuff. So it's going to be catered to every single learning type. So if you're not in the online ground school, go check that out, www.parttimepilot.com. All right, guys, let's get started on section seven, lesson four on spins. A spin is a stall with auto rotation about the vertical axis that is caused by a stall plus a yaw simultaneously. All right, that is quite a few things to, to say in one sentence, but let's break it down. Remember the vertical axis, okay? Yaw is movement about the vertical axis. So we had our marshmallow aircraft. We stuck our roasting stick right through the top of the fuselage. And then when we rotate that roasting stick, the aircraft turns to the left, the nose turns to the left or the right, and the tail follows. That is yaw. It's movement about that vertical axis. So a spin is a stall. So you have a stall with auto rotation about the vertical axis that is caused by that stall. So that auto rotation about that vertical axis is called by that stall plus a yaw simultaneously. The difference between a spiral and a spin, so you may hear of spirals or death spirals or something like that when you're flying or talking to people in aviation. The difference between a spiral and a spin is that there is no stalling in a spiral. So these last few sentences that I've said are key things that might be asked on the FAA written. They might ask, what's the difference between a spiral and a spin? I think I was asked that on my actual check ride. And the difference is that there's actually no stalling in a spiral. The critical angle of attack has yet to be exceeded in a spiral and the wings are still receiving attached flow. So again, if you missed last episode on stalls, you're going to need to listen to that to understand what we're talking about here in this episode. So go back to the last episode, listen to stalls because it talks about the critical angle of attack and how when that's exceeded, that causes a stall and all that and how that works. So go check that out. But in a spiral, the critical angle of attack has yet to be exceeded and the wings are still receiving attached flow. In a spin, the aircraft is in a full stall, not a partial stall. So that's another sort of uh, rumor or misnomer about a spin is that it's a partial stall on one wing or something like that. But that is not true as well. Aircraft is in a full stall, not a partial stall in in a spin, the stalls on either wing are just asymmetrical. So that's kind of where the confusion comes from, meaning they're not stalled the same amount. And that's sort of what leads to the auto rotation. So it means one wing is more stalled than the other, but they still are both stalled, which leads to the spinning motion. So you get a differential of forces on that you're stalled and you get that auto rotation about the vertical axis. A spin can be entered from any flight attitude and from almost any airspeed. So that again, there's so many many gems of sentences in this one paragraph here in the online ground school that are going to make you a safe pilot. And so it's very key that you understand this stuff, but a spin can be entered from any flight attitude and from almost any airspace. So we always got to look out for this. Your turn from base to final is one of the most common times for a pilot to get into a spin as well as a normal stall. Unfortunately, this usually ends up in a crash due to the average spin recovery needing up to 1200 feet of altitude. So in order to if you're like
like right. So this is the average, right? So you could do it a little bit. You could recover in less altitude loss than this, but the average, you know, the, by the time you realize you're in a stall, by the time you react, by the time you start thinking, okay, what's my spin recovery checklist? And you start implementing that, the altitude loss that you have in that condition is going to be, by the time you, you get out of that condition, you're going to have lost an average of 1200 feet of altitude. So that's why when we're on base to final in a traffic pattern, that's about a thousand feet above ground. That is a very, very dangerous spot to get in a spin. And it's also a common spot to get into a spin. So we really have to make sure we hit our air speeds. We have coordinated turns when we're in the pattern flying low and slow. All right. When you are low and slow, you want to avoid uncoordinated turns at all costs. I just said that another common time for a spin to occur is after takeoff when a pilot needs to make a hard bank either to return to the airport in an emergency or for some other reason. So one thing that you really see this on is when these pilots are or overcorrecting, right? So let's say you're turning base to final, but you're low and slow and you overshot turn and you have to get back onto final real quickly. So you overcompensate on the turn. You maybe get in cross controls or something like that. And just when you're low and slow and you're uncoordinated because you maybe overshot or something, that is sort of the situation that leads to these, these very dangerous spins. And the number one way to avoid that, again, is to have these coordinated turns, maintain the exact air speeds we're looking for in the past pattern. If you do overshoot or anything like that, just go around. Don't risk it at those low and slow speeds and situations. So that's that's my little spiel on that. Uh, to recover from a spin, we need to understand what is happening during the spin. The wings are stalled and thus the flow over the wings is separated. This means that the ailerons are not as effective as in normal flight. Power from the aircraft's propeller is aiding in the rotation speed of the aircraft. Therefore, the first thing a pilot should do do when they realize they're in a spin is to reduce power immediately. Then a pilot should attempt to level the wings with ailerons, but do not try to bank out of the spin. In order to counteract the spin, a pilot should use full rudder against the direction of spin. So, right. So if you use the right rudder pedal, that's going to turn your nose to the right. So if you're spinning to the left, then you would want to use the right rudder pedal against. That's what that means, right? Opposite the direction of spin. Finally, a pilot can use their elevator to pitch down and gain airspeed and flow over the wings. Once a safe airspeed is reached, a pilot can add full power and recover from the dive by climbing at a safe velocity. A mnemonic device to remember this spin recovery is PAIR, P-A-R-E, PAIR and recover. So PAIR, the P stands for power, immediately reduce power to idle. A stands for ailerons, level your wings with neutral ailerons. R stands for rudder, full rudder against the direction of spin to combat rotation of the aircraft. The E stands for elevator, use your elevator by pitching down to gain airspeed and recover from stall. Reduce rudder input once spin has stopped. And then recover, once a safe airspeed is reached, add full power and climb at best rate or best angle of climb, VX or VY. So th that is the, the spin recovery checklist that you're gonna wanna remember using pair the mnemonic device pair now if you're just going through ground school and you're not in flight training yet don't worry too much about this this is something that you're going to learn with your flight instructor in flight training but it's a good thing to understand what is happening during a spin the differences between a spin and a spiral and sort of you know that uh, a spin is stall asymmetric stalls on both wings causing auto rotation so rather than just a, a normal stall recovery you have to stop that rotation so that's kind of the differences there that are important to remember as you go into flight training, give you kind of a leg up when your flight instructor starts talking about it. All right, so that's it on the lesson on spins. The Most of the stuff you're gonna learn about spins will be in your flight training. The FA Written just covers a few questions on that, which we covered those key concepts and things you'll need to remember in this lesson. So let's move on to the next lesson on weight. Now, the first lesson of section seven on fundamentals of aerodynamics, we talked about the forces of flight. We talked about lift, weight, thrust and drag. So we're kind of going over those again in a little bit more detail. We talked about lift and then we talked about stalls because it's very the loss of lift. So we wanted to throw that in there too. Same thing with spins. Now we're going to talk about weight, thrust and drag. We'll probably just get to weight and thrust here and then drag's a little bit longer one. So we'll get to that maybe in the next episode. So without further ado, let's move on to lesson five, weight of section seven of the online ground school. 
Weight is the opposite force of lift. Weight is simply the downward force of gravity on a certain mass. So in the instance of an aircraft, the aircraft's mass times the gravitational constant gives you the force of weight downwards caused by that aircraft's mass in Earth's gravity. The center of gravity or CG of an aircraft may be considered as a point at which all the weight of an aircraft is concentrated. If an aircraft were supported exactly at its CG, it would be perfectly balanced. So if you could have a really, really strong, like super tight titanium point and you could set your aircraft directly on top of that point right exactly so that point is right on the cg it would be perfectly balanced but we'll get to this more about the cg of an aircraft and how you calculate that for your weight and balance when we get into cross-country planning but right now just remember weight is the force of gravity on an aircraft's mass and it opposes the force of lift now you're probably asking yourself well then what the hell is the difference between weight and mass when i weigh myself on a scale is that my weight or my mass why do we call it weight It's actually your mass, but almost everyone wrongly states it as their weight, at least in the United States. In scientific terms, your weight is what you measure yourself on the scale times the gravitational constant. For example, if you weighed yourself on the scale and you see 80 kilograms, your force of weight is 80 kilograms times the gravitational constant of 9.8 meters per second squared. So in terms of an aircraft, the aircraft's mass is what is measured on the scale and written in the pilot operating handbook as an empty weight or gross weight. Yes, they still say weight. I know that's confusing, even though it's a mass. And the aircraft weight, or the force of weight, which we're talking about, is actually that mass, the empty weight mass, it should be called empty mass. So that mass times 9.8 meters per second squared. If we wanted to calculate the force of aircraft's weight using pounds instead of kilograms like we do in the United States, where our unit of mass is pounds, we would use a different gravitational constant other than 9.8. But don't worry, you won't ever have to calculate this. This is simply to help with your understanding. So if your aircraft was 1,000 kilograms, your force of weight would be 1,000 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, or 9,000 800 kilograms meters per second squared of force. So 9,800 units of force. Lift is required to counteract the aircraft's weight. In stabilized level flight, when the lift force is equal to the weight force, the aircraft is in a state of equilibrium and neither accelerates up or down. So you don't go up in the altitude or you don't go down in the altitude when lift equals weight. Therefore, in order to fly, your aircraft wings would need to generate equal to or more than that 9,800 units units of force. So that's what I wanted you guys to get out of this lesson here is, okay, weight opposes lift and it's the weight force. And the weight force is that mass times the gravitational constant. And that kind of tells you how much lift you're going to have to create to maintain flight. It's a balance of the forces here and lift, it's lift versus weight. And that's what I wanted you to get out of this lesson here. There's not many questions about this specifically on the FA written, but I threw it into our course because I think it helps give you a better understanding of what's going on in flight. Okay, so that was our lesson on weight. Now let's move on to lesson six on thrust. This is in section seven, fundamentals of aerodynamics, lesson six on thrust. Thrust is the aerodynamic force that propels an aircraft forward. For an aircraft to start moving forward, the thrust has to be greater than the drag. Then, in order to keep the aircraft at a constant airspeed, the thrust has to equal the drag. If thrust is greater than drag, the aircraft will accelerate, which is a positive change in airspeed. Airspeed increases. If thrust is less than drag, the aircraft will decelerate, negative change in airspeed. Just as lift and weight must be equal in order to maintain a constant altitude, thrust and drag must be equal to maintain a constant airspeed. Therefore, for straight, level, an unaccelerated flight, an aircraft's lift equals weight, its thrust equals its drag. So again, it's all a balance of forces. And now before we were talking about lift versus weight, now we're talking about thrust versus drag. To think about thrust, I like to think about a rocket. A rocket has no wings and does not use the force of lift to escape the atmosphere. Instead, a rocket uses pure thrust to overtake the force of its weight and blast out of the atmosphere. Now turn that rocket sideways 
and put some wings on it and you have an airplane, a super fast rocket plane for that matter. For our purposes though, the thrust doesn't come out of a bunch of fuel and air fireballs coming out of the back of the airplane like a rocket. It comes from the propeller. The propeller cuts through the air just as wings do to provide lift. But instead of in the vertical direction, the propeller provides the lift or thrust in the horizontal direction. Thrust is the forward force caused by the propeller. It's the same dynamics as lift on a wing. So take that episode and that lesson we talked about lift and how the airfoil of a wing, it creates a pressure differential above and below it because of that shape of the airfoil. A propeller, if you cut the cross section of a propeller, it also has an airfoil. But instead of traveling through you know, the air along with the motion of your aircraft, it's perpendicular to that motion and it's cutting through the air perpendicular, just like a propeller would do in water. But it's still doing the same thing. When it spins around, it's cutting through that air and creating a pressure differential in front of and behind the propeller blades. That pressure differential creates that forward propeller motion, that forward force, just like lift. It's basically lift, but in the forward direction caused by that spinning propeller. Without thrust, an airplane is just a glider. A glider will slowly descend to the ground without the help of wind or thrust or thermal vents or something like that. Once you add a thrusting propeller, you can maintain altitude and are now considered an airplane. Furthermore, you can add more thrust to increase your speed and get places much faster. So that is thrust. The key parts of thrust I want you to understand and the reason I put this lesson in here, again, not many questions on the FA written about thrust, if any, but the things I wanted you to remember is that it opposes drag when they are in equilibrium. It's a balance of the forces, right? When they're in equilibrium, the same amount of drag and thrust, you're going to have a constant airspeed. When thrust is more, you're going to accelerate. When thrust is less than drag, you're going to decelerate. Then on top of that, thrust is created by the propeller and the propeller has airfoils just like the wings do, but it's done in a perpendicular direction from the wings, right? Instead of the wings creating a force up and down, right? A vertical force. It's a horizontal or lateral force created by the propeller spinning through that perpendicular plane. So that's what I want you to remember out of this lesson on thrust. Okay, so that is going to be the episode for today. It's a little bit shorter, I know, but we got through spins, we got through weight, we got thrust, and the next one is a bigger lesson, so I wanna save it for the next episode, and that's gonna be lesson seven on drag. We're gonna talk about the different types of drag, how they are created, and what you need to know about those types of drag for your FA written or your check write oral exam. So we will get to section seven, fundamentals of aerodynamics, lesson seven drag, in the next episode. Thank you guys for listening and I will catch you next week.